as we uh, sing this one. This is obviously a great one we're going to sing to our Lord. Yeah. 
Say this prayer together from Psalm 51. It's the first four verses. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever for me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Father, we know that you're righteous and you're holy and you're just. And Lord, we recognize that we, we have sinned and gone against you and we confess, we agree, O oh God, that our sin is before you. And so Father, we ask that you would grant us forgiveness. Lord, we don't want to do that. Father, we, we with Paul say there's things that we 
want to do, we don't do, and things we don't want to do, we do. And so, oh, wretched people that we are, we ask for your help today, Lord. We don't want to sin, but we, we thank you that you are righteous, yet forgiving and merciful God. And we have an advocate, Jesus. We thank you for your grace and for your mercies. We thank you that you plead on our behalf and that you forgive us of our sins if we confess them before you. So we come now and confess those to you, Lord. Please change our hearts. Please renew us. Please wash over us and blot out all those iniquities inside of us and the transgressions. Lord, we ask that you would help us not walk against you, but walk with you and keep in step with your Holy Spirit. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. We have this great assurance also from the Psalms. In Psalm 40, David said, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. So we're excited uh, that you've chosen to worship with this morning. We're excited what the Lord is doing, and we're, we're going to go and talk to this part of our service. We're going to pray on behalf of those uh, who are hurting and those who are in need, and particularly with our congregation of prayer. So 
Um, we're going to do that in just a moment. But I also want to uh, remember to pray also for our leaders, as we see in Paul's admonition to Timothy, to be reminded us that we are to pray for our leaders and those in our authorities and um, ask the Lord to do uh, His work in the lives of uh, those that are making decisions, uh, not only in our country, but around the world. And uh, most importantly, we want to pray for the gospel to go forward. We want to pray as uh, God has promised to continue to build His church. We want to ask the Lord to build His church. And we're not specifically talking about buildings. We're talking about people's lives being saved and, be, and being changed and transformed by the power of the gospel. And so uh, may God uphold us and strengthen us and equip us to carry forth that message. Uh, this also is a time of an offering, uh, offertory, and this is a time where we're able to give back to the Lord. Just a small token of what He's done for us. He saved our souls. We're no longer our own, but we've been bought with a price. Therefore, Paul reminds the Corinthian church to glorify God with your bodies. Whether we eat or drink, whatever we do, we ought to do all to the glory of God, and content, uh, including providing uh, finances so that the gospel will go forward. God enables us to do that and blessed us in so many ways so that we could be generous and bless others. So we encourage you right there online. You can give online. You can write a check and send it to uh, the P.O. Box address that's listed for, before us. Uh, and uh, you can give back to the Lord in, in that way. We, ch we challenge you. And we encourage you to do that as an act of worship. Uh, for God loves a cheerful giver. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you for this time. And God, our Father, Holy Father, we come to you on behalf of those who are in need. Father, we pray for JJ. We ask that you would continue to minister to her as she's walking through this bout of cancer. Lord, we ask that you would strengthen her and her husband Craig and their family, that you would uh, uphold them and that you would be their all in all during this time. Father, we ask for your wisdom and discernment and strength. Father, uh, we pray for uh, the family, uh, the Amesbury's, as they are leaving us uh, shortly and moving to uh, North Carolina. Lord, we ask that you sustain them and strengthen them and provide a gospel-leaving church for them to uh, plug into there. Father, <clears throat> we ask that you would be with Gail, that you would uh, come alongside of her. She's been through so many bouts with cancer, and now uh, she still has a, a ways to go. Lord, we ask that you would comfort her, that you provide for her and Bob and strengthen them in, in all their needs, Lord. Lord, we come to you this morning and ask that you be with our servicemen. Lord, we ask that you be... Uh, with Ethan, and Lord, that you be with Gabe, and that you would provide everything they need as they're serving our country, that you would uh, just provide a, a wonderful group of believers that would surround them and encourage them, uh, particularly during this time. Father, we pray for our first responders. Lord, we pray for uh, those that are on the front lines. We pray for uh, Leslie, and we pray for Brent, and we pray uh, for Patrick, and um, we pray for all those uh, that are uh, serving others' needs. And Lord, we ask that you would help them to do that, uh, to glorify you and their occupation, to love others well, to make your gospel known. And uh, Father, we just ask that you sustain them and strengthen them and provide everything that they need. Lord, we look to you and ask that you would be with our workers, the gospel workers around the world, our missionaries. Lord, that you sustain them during this time. As many of them are in lockdown, they're quarantined in their particular countries, Lord. They're not even able to go outside for a walk. Lord, we ask that you would that you would sustain them and strengthen them and be with your church there and across the world. Lord, that we know that as we are bound so many times, we know as you promised, Timothy, that your word is not bound. And so, oh God, we ask for the power of the gospel to go forward. And as many countries, as we look around the world, are trying to suppress Christianity, even in the midst of this crisis, we see there's an even more of a persecution against Christians around the globe. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you are good. We thank you that you are sovereign. And we thank you that you are unstoppable. And so, God, we ask for your plan, your purposes, and your church to go forward 
for you to bring fruit for the proclamation of the gospel, and by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would do above and beyond what we could even think or imagine. And we ask that every gift given this morning, every amount of money that's sacrificed today, would go for the furtherance of your holy name, for the sake of your glory. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Verse 1, 
I'm not going to read the text in its entirety. I'm going to read the beginning and the end, and then we'll walk through it together. Rome, uh, excuse me, Joshua 22, uh, verse 1. At that time, Joshua summoned the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, and said to them, You have kept all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you. You have obeyed my voice and all that I have commanded you. You have not forsaken your brothers these many days, down to this day, but have been careful to keep the charge of the Lord your God. And now the Lord your God has given you rest to your brothers as he has promised them. Therefore, turn and go to your tents in my land, or in the land where your possession lies, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you on the other side of the Jordan. Only be careful to observe the commandment and the law of Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you to love the Lord your God and to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and to cling to him and serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. So Joshua blessed them and sent them, and they went on into their tents. We turn to the end of Joshua chapter 22, look in verse 30 and following. When Phinehas, the priest and the chief of the congregation, the heads of the families of Israel who were with him, heard the words that the people of Reuben and the people of Gad and the people of Manasseh spoke, it was good in their eyes. And Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the priest, said to the people of Reuben, the people of Gad, the people of Manasseh, Today we know that the Lord is in our midst, because you have not committed this breach of faith against the Lord. Now you have delivered the people of Israel from the hand of the Lord. And then Phinehas and the son of Eleazar, the priest and the chiefs, returned to the people of Reuben, the people of Gad, and the land of Gilead, and the land of Canaan, to the people of Israel, and brought back word to them. And the report was good in the eyes of the people of Israel. And the people of Israel blessed God, and spoke no more of making war against them to destroy the land where the people of Reuben and the people of Gad had settled. The people of Reuben and the people of Gad called the altar witness. For they said, it is a witness between us that the Lord is God. Father, we thank you for your word. We ask that your word would go forward, that you would be glorified, that your truth would sanctify us, and that Jesus would be exalted, we pray in his name. Amen. John Wooden was, is a, was the historic coach of the UCLA Bruins. He was a devout Christian. He won more national championships than any other Division I coach. He won 10 national championships. As he uh, brought in new players for the new year, and they began to go over every single year uh, what was going to happen for that year, he would begin with this. He didn't begin with a basketball. He didn't uh, begin on the court. He began in the locker room, and he began with a sock. And he said, this is how you're to put your socks on your feet. And he went with the left foot and showed them how to put their sock on the left foot. And then he began with the right foot, and he showed them how to put the sock on the right foot. And you think, we, this is Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, right? Uh, Lou Alcindor, who was a leading, is a leading point getter in the NBA history. He had Bill Walton, one of the greatest players of all time. All these players there and young men and they think they're ready to play for the national champion UCLA Bruins and they begin by putting their socks on their feet. What in the world has happened? He's saying because you have to begin to build the team at the ground level. What he says is if you do not put your socks on correctly then you'll derive blisters on your feet. And if you have blisters on your feet then you're going to be thinking about what's going on with your feet during the basketball game, and you're not going to be able to play basketball. And so it is with our lives. We have to start with the foundation and ask the question, what are we building our lives upon? What are we building our lives upon? In Joshua chapter 22 through 24, the people of Israel have settled in the land. They have been apportioned their inheritance and now God says, therefore, this is what you ought to do. If we just read Joshua 22 in isolation, it would look like all that God does is tell us what to do and gives us 
commands. But that's not what, it, what he does. If you look in Joshua chapter 22, it says, After the people of the Reubenites, the Gadites, and uh, the half-tribe of Manasseh had finished their allegiance to the other nine and a half tribes, in verse 2 it says, You have kept all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, and have obeyed my voice have com that he commanded you. You have not forsaken your brothers these many days, down to this day, but have been careful to keep charge of the Lord your God. And now the Lord your God has given rest to your brothers as he has promised. Therefore. But what he does here, it says, remember in Numbers when Moses gave you the land on the eastern side of the Jordan River, yet you made a promise and a vow that you would go with your brothers, that you would leave your families there that were settled in their cities and their allotment of the land, and you would go over the Jordan and pass through, and for seven years you would give your lives and give your service so that the people would be defeated, the enemies would be routed, and that they would be your brothers and sisters given the allotment that they were to receive from the Lord. And now you have fulfilled that vow. Now you have completed an utter obedience. And God has given you rest. But look at verse 4. It says, therefore, this is what you ought to do. Well, what's the there, therefore? That's what we have to ask when we're reading the Bible. What's this conjunction hinging on? It's, it's hinging on this command, but there's something before the therefore. So if you go back to chapter 21, verse 43 through 45, we see the centrality of the word of Joshua throughout the entire book. The, the, the whole book hinges on these words. Verse 43, chapter 21, Thus the Lord gave to Israel all the land he swore to give to their fathers. And they took possession of it and settled there. God promised Abraham, God promised Jacob that he would give them the land, and he did it. Verse 44, And the Lord gave them rest on every side, just as he had sworn to their fathers. He did what he said he was going to do. Not one of all the enemies withstood them, for the Lord had given all their enemies into their hands. God completely defeated their enemies and destroyed those who were against him, those who were occupying the land that he had promised to his sons and daughters. And verse 45, not one word of all the good promises that the Lord had made to the house of Israel had failed. All came to pass. God was completing His promise and fulfilling them on behalf of the people of Israel. They didn't have to worry. God had completely done everything that God said He was going to do. All the promises of God have been fulfilled on behalf of the people of Israel. Therefore, you can do this. The entirety of the book of Romans, as we read about the magnificent salvation that we have in Jesus Christ, Paul, writing to a church that he had never encountered, never planted, never seen, writes to them, articulating in careful detail the ex exposition of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Romans 1 through 11, it's clear that God uh, demonstrated His own love toward us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. That we have peace with God through justification by faith alone. That though we are all sinners and we have fallen short of the glory of God, it says that God put forward Christ as a propitiation for our sins. That we to be received by faith that Christ died for us, though we were still His enemies. God reconciled us to Himself through the death of His Son. And it, it becomes so heightened, this glorious, magnificent salvation, that in the end of chapter 11, He says, Oh, the depths and riches and knowledge of God. Who has been His counselor? Or who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has given Him a gift that He should be repaid? For from Him and to Him and through Him are all things. To God be the glory forever. Amen. Therefore, therefore, I beseech you, brethren, uh, the mercies of God to offer your lives, your bodies, as a living sacrifice Holy and acceptable, for this is your spiritual act of worship. 
This is what you are to do. This is what you are to, to, to be commissioned to go out and accomplish now. Why? How? In view of all the mercies of God. He commends or commands and commissions the two and a half tribes to go back to the land and to obey and to do what they are required to do. These commands, why? Because in light of the mercies of God. Because He's already built on that foundation and fulfilled every promise on their behalf. God has already done what we could not do. The law could not do. Christ has done by coming and giving His life for us. He says, therefore, in Joshua 22 and verse 4, Therefore, turn and go to your tents and the land where your possession lies, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, had given you on the other side of the Jordan. Only be careful. Now watch this. Number one, observe the commandment. Number two, he says, um, love the Lord your God. Just like the Shema, right? Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Deuteronomy chapter 6. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the law, right? Keep the law. Love the Lord your God, number two. Number three, walk in all His ways. Number four, keep His commandments. Number five, cling to Him. Now that's the same word that Jesus in Genesis 2.24, when it says a man shall leave his father and mother and cling unto his wife. Cleave unto the, to his wife and the two shall become one. We should cleave to God and serve Him with all your heart and with all your soul. This is, an, an, this is encompassing all of our being we are to serve God. This is law. This is command. This is obedience. But it's based on what precedes the therefore. And that is the promises of God. That is the work of God already on behalf of the people. It is grace that inspires works. In Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 it says you have been saved by what? Grace. Through faith. This is not a, your own doing. It's the it's gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one can boast. That's not where he stops. He says, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, that we should walk in them that we created beforehand. That we should walk in the good works because we have been saved by grace. Because we have a new nature, because we have a, a new heart, because we have been regenerated, because we have been born again, so that we can walk in the works that God's already created for us. Therefore, we can do the commands of God because of what He's already done. Now, if you notice that God has given you peace on behalf of your people, there's, there's no more enemies. There's no more against you. And you can cling to God. You can... You can you can obey God. You can do His law. Why? Because now you have peace with God. You have shalom. But listen very carefully. Peace with God. Peace with God does not mean we remain idle. Do you hear that? Peace with God does not mean we no longer work. It, peace with God inspires a greater fervency to honor God. See, before we couldn't honor God, all we can do is sin because we have a nature that's dead to God. But now, because we're in God and He saved us and He triumphed over our enemies, He revealed Himself to take away sin, to destroy the works of the devil. He has renewed us and given us this new nature. We have been created in Christ Jesus. Now we have the ability by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to carry out His work, to obey Him. Obedience springs forth from what? It springs forth from love. From love. It says, love God. I want to love God. Why? Because He first loved me. We love God, 1 John 4, 19, because He first loved us. This is love. That Not that we love God. We did it. But He first loved us and gave His Son as a propitiation, a substitute to receive the judgment we deserve in our place for our sins. We love 
God now. We obey God. We cling to God. We serve God because He first loved us. I didn't choose you, O Israel, Deuteronomy 7, because you were more numerous than other people, but because I loved you. We, we want to love God now because He's demonstrated His own love for us, that He's poured it out into our hearts. And why would He over and over and over and over again repetitively tell them in different ways to obey God? To obey God. Because our hearts are changing. Our hearts are ever more changing and we need to be steadfastly rooted in God. It's a reminder for us continuously, a reminder to stir up by way of reminder this is where you ought to be. This is where you ought to go. This is what you need to be a part of. Yes, yes, yes. And we need to do that. Obedience, obedience, God says, springs forth from love. And he does this as a way of reminder, stirring up inside of us this understanding that because he first loved, you ought to love and continue. And if you keep my commands, this is my love. If you love one another, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. And my commandments are not burdensome. Because those who have been redeemed by the Lord want to honor and bless and and love God. It's faithfulness. You've shown your faithfulness. God has shown His faithfulness to you. And this is a response to God. Ken Matthews, Old Testament professor uh, from my seminary, says, There's no holiday for steadfastness in the Lord. There's no holiday for steadfastness in the Lord. There's, there's no time where obedience is just a suggestion. Uh, if you look in the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19, and 20, right before that it says, All authority in heaven and on earth have been given to me. That's Christ in verse 18. And then verse 19 says, Therefore, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. In other words, the therefore that you will be... Uh, empowered by the authority and the power of Christ who's sending you. As the Father sent me, so I'm sending you. He says, go therefore and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And check this phrase out that's often eliminated in our own minds, our own thoughts. It says this one little phrase, right after that phrase, in verse 20, says, and I'm with you always to the end of the age. All authority has been given to me, I give to you. My, my power to send you out, and I will be with you always. But this little phrase says, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. Teaching them to obey. I love that Kevin DeYoung, he, he writes a book called Whole in Your Holiness. And inside that book, he describes this. He says, listen, we cannot be about the Great Commission unless we're about one another's obedience. Because it says right there from Jesus, teach them to obey. Teach them to observe. Not because we're trying to earn the favor of God, but because we have His love and now we want to please Him and we're commissioned by Him to go observe His law, His commands, to love the Lord your God. Verse 7, now to the one and a half tribe of Manasseh, Moses had given possession of Bashan, but to the other Half Joshua had given possession beside the brothers in the land west of the Jordan. And when Joshua sent them to their homes and blessed them, he said to them, Go back to your tents with which your wealth and which your very much livestock, silver, gold, bronze, and iron, and with much clothing. And this is what he says Divide the spoil of your enemies with your brothers. So the people of Reuben, the people of Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh returned home, parting from the people of Israel to Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan, to go to the land of Gilead, their own land, which they had possessed themselves by the command of the Lord through Moses. It's a magnificent thing. Not only are you given these cities and these places, and not only did God defeat your enemies, but He's given you the blessing of the spoils from which comes of those people. Do you realize that you get gold and iron and silver and livestock? You get animals. You get all these things. And what does he say? He says, divide it. 
Share it. Give it away. He says, don't just hoard it. Jesus, interestingly, one of my favorite parables in the New Testament, Jesus shares in Luke chapter 12, he says about a man who had, had, had overcome with wealth, and he says, I don't have enough places to put my stuff, so what shall I do? Ah, I shall build builder barns and store my place. And Jesus has a condemning, judging word for this person. And uh, he explains that so it is with those who are not rich toward God. In other words, if we uh, continue to hoard the things that God has given us, then we will not be on board with Him and we will receive consequences for that. What he says is, as a Christian... As a believer in Jesus Christ, we are not called to be cul-de-sacs who hoard the blessings of God, but we're called to be conduits for which the blessings of God can flow through us. We're not called to, to, to take the things that God's given us and just keep them for ourselves, but we're called to bless the world. I blessed you, Abraham, so that through you, you will be a blessing to other people. And 2 Corinthians uh, Paul talks about giving. He talks about the blessings of God. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning in verse 6, he says, The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things, at all times, that you may abound in every good work. As is written, He has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. God has blessed us so that we could bless other people. In fact, if you're listening to this podcast, and you live in the United States, it's, uh, you're wealthy, considering the world standards, you're much more wealthy than uh, 85 to 90 percent of the rest of the world. And so God has given us cars, God has given us air conditioners, God has given us houses, God has given us clothes, God has given us so many things and money and resources, not so that we keep them for ourselves or spend them on ourselves, but so that we can bless the nations with them. So that we can be cheerfully giving to Him. It's not under compulsion. It's not because I fear that I will die by writing not enough uh, 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 zeros on the end of my check. But that because I can't wait to bless other people because I've tasted and seen that the Lord is good. And I want others to taste and see of His goodness. Mm -hmm. We want to be a generous people. We want to divide the spoil. We want others to share in Christ. Verse 10, Joshua 22. And when they came to the region of Jordan, that is in the land of Canaan, the people of Reuben, the people of Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, built there an altar by the Jordan, an altar of imposing size. This is a magnificent altar. They recognized it. Word got back to the other nine and a half tribes. Verse 11. And the people of Israel heard it. They said, Behold, the people of Reuben, the people of Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, have built the altar at the frontier of the land of Canaan, in the region of that's about the Jordan, on the side that belongs to the people of Israel. So they didn't build it on the eastern side where they were, they built it on the western side where the nine and a half tribes were. And when the people of Israel heard of it, the whole assembly of the people of Israel gathered at Shiloh to make war against them. Now think about this. The two and a half tribes just committed their a vow, and they fulfilled it, and they went in, they fought on the sides of the brothers, and now they're... They're, they're just back into the land. They built an altar, and now there's already going to be war and then the people of Israel. Verse 13. The people of Israel sent to the people of Reuben, the people of Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh in the land of Gilead, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the priest, and with him ten sheaths, one from each of the tribal families of Israel, every one of them the head of the family of the clans of Israel. And they came to the people of Reuben, the Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. Why does it keep repeating that? Because I hope... Uh, and the, the author is trying to get you to remember this, to understand there's where the people are. The land of Gilead, they said to them, Thus says the whole congregation of the Lord. By the way, that's only the nine and a half tribes, not the two and a half tribes. But uh, it, it's, it's making a suggestion here in verse 16, the whole congregation, because they're speaking before the Lord. 
What is this breach of faith that you have committed against God of Israel and turning away this day from following the Lord by building yourselves an altar this day in rebellion against the Lord? Have we not had enough of the sin of Peor from which even the, we have not cleansed ourselves or which they came out of the plague upon the congregation of Israel? That you too must turn away this day from following the Lord? And if you too rebel against the Lord today, then tomorrow He will be angry with the whole congregation of Israel. But now, if the land of your possession is unclean, pass over into the Lord's land, where the Lord's tabernacle stands, and take for yourselves a possession among us. Only do not rebel against the Lord your God, or make us rebels by building for yourselves an altar other than the altar of the Lord our God. Do not Achan, the son of Zerah, break faith in the matter of devoted things, and wrath fell upon the congregation of Israel? And he did not perish alone for his iniquity. So the two and a half tribes get back, they build an altar, a grand altar. The people of the nine and a half tribes of Israel find out, and they're wanting to make war. But wisely, they sent Phinehas, with uh, representative delegates, with him from the tribes uh, because Phineas is the spiritual leader of the people of Israel. So he goes, the son of El Eleazar, he's from the Levitical line. He goes out and he meets with them and discusses with them. He has experience in this. We'll see in a moment. Um, but he wants to understand what in the world's going on. And so they, the reason is because to build an altar or to build something uh, <clears throat> that would provide the sacrifices that would oppose the tabernacle or the altar at the tabernacle in Shiloh would be against God. So they want to make sure that they're not committing apostasy. Apostasy is simply the change your position. So they want to see, are they going against God by removing themselves from the actual worship of Yahweh and they're going somewhere else and they're taking another stand. If they do this, Deuteronomy tells us that then they can go and kill them and uh, because of their uh, a lack of worship for God. And so they go out with an intention to make sure that they are cleansing and they are not being unclean. That's the priest's job. And so, but if you look at the text, it says several times it refers to sin, a breach of faith. But look what it is, against the God of Israel. And, and look, keep you, uh, verse uh, uh, 16, from following the Lord, right? If you, if you look at verse 18, turn away from following the Lord. And rebel, verse 18, against the Lord. Our, our verse 19, um, at, uh, 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 only do not rebel against the Lord and make us rebel rebels as well against the Lord our God. You continue to see, or, and then uh, verse 20, that the, the, uh, Achan was uh, killed for his iniquity and others along with him. And you see it, iniquity, transgression, rebellion, sin. You see all these words communicating, but the, the communication is it's against God. That our primary, our primary sin in our life, and our, uh, the sin of our lives, is first and foremost against God. That as we read this morning from Psalm 51, when David sinned and Nathan came to him months later and, and confronted him, then David repented. But notice in Psalm 51, it says that against you and you only have I sinned. David was not saying he didn't sin against Bathsheba. David was not saying he didn't sin against Uriah. But he said, and all those sins that we commit, it's ultimately against God. And so, people pose this question, doesn't it seem a little harsh that God would send someone to hell to receive wrath forever simply because they sinned against God? That seems unjust. That seems like the consequences don't match the crime. And that's just because we have a puny little brain to understand the, the, the reality of our crime uh, uh, it, it, and the consequences will fit the and match the crime. So, for example, um, you, you talk about uh, lying, and we lie with our neighbor. We say it's, we, we committed a lie against our neighbor. That's not going to put you in jail. But if we commit treason, which is lying, trading, 
a treason against the United States of America, that's a little bit more of a hefty crime. And so what, what we realize is and the reason the crime or, or sin against God is so treasonous, is, is so uh, 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 vastly uh, judged and punished so cruelly is because God is so holy. I, we don't have a grasp on the infinite worth of God. God is so vastly greater and supreme and glorious beyond our imagination. That's why when we sin against Him, if we do not repent and trust Jesus, then we will be cast into hell forever, receiving His wrath and punishment because it is against the value and the worth of the holiness of God. That's what they're alluding to. If you've gone against God. Your sin is first and foremost against God. And what we want you to do and to know is that not only your sin against God, but your sin has consequences that will not only be consequences you will reap, but it will affect other people. We see it with the sin of Peor, verse 17. We see it with the sin of Achan. Achan, in chapter 7 of Joshua, not only dies, but his family dies with him. 36 people die because of Achan's sin to grasp hold of some of the devoted things which he was not supposed to plunder. And the sin of Peor, if you turn to Numbers, or want to follow along this, this morning in Numbers chapter 25, we read that story. Quite graphic. The people of Israel have committed sin against God. They have gone after other gods. Verse 2. These invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods. The people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel yoked himself to Baal of Peor. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And the Lord said to Moses, Take all the chiefs of the people and hang them in the sun before the Lord, that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn from Israel. And Moses said to the judges of Israel, Each of you kill those men and yoke themselves to the Baal of Peor. God's serious about His name. God is serious about uh, who He is and His holiness. He says, I will be worshipped. I will not give my glory to another. Verse 6, And behold, one of the people of Israel came and brought a Midianite woman to his family. In the sight of Moses, in the sight of the whole congregation of the people of Israel, while they were weeping in the entrance of the tent of meeting, when Phineas, the same Phineas is that is there, and, and Joshua, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose and left the congregation and took a spear in his hand. And he went after the man of Israel into the chamber and pierced both of them, the man of Israel and the woman, through her belly. Thus the plague of the people of Israel was stopped. It's serious. God is serious about sin. Verse 9. Nevertheless, those who died in the plague were 24,000 people. Our sin certainly affects other people. And God is serious about sin. Phineas, they sinned because they knew. Now he knew how to deal with sin. We look inside the church of Jesus Christ. And we see that God is concerned about the holiness of His people and His bride, the church. So concerned about it is that He said He spilt His own blood for the church. And He continues to want to purify and to keep the bride pure. That's why in Matthew 18, Jesus describes the formula for church discipline. And you see these same principles in Joshua 22. They send out a delegate. They send out Phineas. And to confront the people to see if they've sinned. And if Matthew 18, you go by one. And if the person repents, great. If he doesn't, you bring along a couple others with you. And confront them of their sin. If they continue to refuse continue to refuse to repent. Then you bring them before the entire church. What is the purpose? So that they would be restored. So that they would turn. So they would trust God. And so that their lives would not continue on in rebellion against God. And so that the people, the whole bride, the church would not be affected. Look in verse 21. The people respond. The people of Reuben, the people of Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh said in answer to the heads of the families of Israel, 
The mighty one, the God, a uh, God, the Lord. The mighty one, God, the Lord. I love this. It's El Elohim Yahweh. What, what he says here twice, you can see it in the English. God, the greatness of God. And then God, the same God, the word for God that was used in Genesis 1, 1, that created the world. And Yahweh, the personal essence, name of God and His reputation, the everlasting, eternally existing one, I am who I am. He says it twice because he, they're concerned for God. They have not gone against God. They didn't build an altar to go against Yahweh. They did not build an altar to try to go and alter the plans of God. They built an altar because, uh, and in a few months we'll see, because they wanted to identify with God. They believed in God's supremacy. They cared about God's name. This is why it's repeated over and again. They were about God's glory. So I have to ask us this question. Do we care about God's supremacy? Do we care about the greatness and the grandeur of God? In, in Colossians chapter 1, Paul reminds the church of Colossia. He says this. He says, He, Jesus Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn among all creation. For by Him all things were created, visible and invisible, but the things in heaven or on earth, all powers, rulers, and authorities were created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. He is the firstborn among the dead. He is the head of the body, the church, so that in everything, Christ, I like the NIV here, might have supremacy. That Jesus is supreme. And do we, church, do we have the same same passion and zeal for the supremacy of Christ Jesus that these people have. That they are, are committed to it. They're not trying to go against God. They're a lifting up Christ's name. They're lifting up God's name. Is that who we are? He knows. Verse 22. He knows. Let Israel itself know if it was rebellion or breach of faith against the Lord. Do not spear us today. We're willing to die for this. You kill us if we have gone against God. Quite a statement. For building an altar, verse 23, to turn away from following the Lord, or if we have done so to offer burnt offerings or grain offerings or peace offerings on it, may the Lord Himself take vengeance on us. No, we did it from fear in the time to come. Your children might say to our children, What have you to do with the Lord, the God of Israel? For the Lord has made the Jordan a boundary between us and you, you people of Reuben, you people of Gad. You have no portion in the Lord. That's the fear. So your children might make our children cease to worship the Lord. Therefore we said, let us now build an altar, not for burnt offering or for sacrifice, but to be a witness between us and you, between our generations after us, that we may perform the service of of the Lord and the presence with our burnt offerings and sacrifice and peace offerings. So your children will not say to our children in the time to come, you have no portion in the Lord. And we thought if this should be said of us to our descendants in time to come, we should say, behold, the copy of the altar of the Lord, which our fathers made, not for burnt offerings nor for sacrifice, but to be a witness between us and you. Far be it from us that we should rebel against the Lord and turn away this day from following the Lord by building an altar, an offering, a burnt offering, and grain offering, or sacrifice other than the altar of the Lord our God that stands before the tabernacle. The reason that we built the altar is, number one, is because... We care about the generations to come, and we want our children to understand just because there's a river that separates us, we're one people, and we serve one God. And we want our children to know that they have a portion with Yahweh, that their covenant has been made, and that if they trust and personally put their faith in God, then the, He will become to them the, his, their God, and they will be His people. They, they built an altar as a witness to bear forth witness that they care enough about their children to intentionally now pass on the greatness of God to them. Do we have that same passion? 
Are we considering just our own needs and our own values? Are we intentionally, intentionally passing on the gospel of Jesus Christ to the next generation? Here's my question for us. It's not simply that we say the gospel, we use the words, but that we are so diligently, Deuteronomy 6, bringing before the next generations the, the name and the person, the work of God, that we actually in detail describe before them what the gospel is. Namely, that there is a holy God, a holy, holy, holy God that we sang about this morning. Blessed three persons and one God, Trinity. This God who created us, he created us to glorify and honor and worship Him. But we have rebelled. We have broken faith. We have sinned. We have been bent out of shape and gone our own way and done our own thing and gone against Him and transgressed God's law. And therefore, because God is holy, right, and just, He must punish sin. And we stand born in this world under the, the righteous wrath of God. That's where we are, under the just judgment of God. But God in His glorious wisdom and infinite grace has provided His only Son, Jesus Christ, to come in this world, to live a perfect life for 33 years. And then voluntarily give up His own life to absorb the punishment that we deserve and rise from the dead and then sit down at the right hand of the Father and rule and reign over everything. And then we continue to preach and press to turn from your sin, repent, and trust Jesus Christ alone. That's the gospel. Do we continue intentionally pressing that upon the next generation? That's our calling, brothers and sisters. The second thing we see here is that the witness before them, not only that they pass it on to generations, but this is a symbolic understanding and reminder of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a, a reminder that we have for us. And those two reminders are baptism and the Lord's Supper. We have baptism by immersion here at Christ Community Church because it's a picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ. As you go down in the water, this baptism doesn't save you, but it's a symbolic picture of what happens when we die with Christ and our sin is hidden in Jesus and then as we come up out of the water, we are being crucified with Christ, and we no longer live, but Christ lives in us, and now we can walk this life out in newness, because we are new creatures. Behold, the old has gone away, and all things have become new. That's a picture of the gospel. And the second thing is the Lord's Supper. Jesus not only commanded us, He said, eat this bread, and drink this cup, and do this in remembrance of me. But what happens in the gospel, what happens uh, by proclaiming the gospel, what happens in the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians 11, 26, he said, every time you do this, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It's a picture, a visible expression of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a witness to us and our own souls and a witness to the world. Verse 30, when Phineas the priest and the chiefs of the congregation, the heads of the families of Israel who were with him, heard the words that the people of Reuben, the people of Gad, the, ha the people of Manasseh spoke. It was good in their eyes. And Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the priest, said to the people of Reuben, the people of Gad, and the people of Manasseh, Today we know the Lord is in our midst. Because you have not committed this breach of faith against the Lord, now you have delivered the people of Israel from the hand of the Lord. What happens is as Phineas stands in the high priest or the priest, he says, Listen, a great thing has happened today. A great thing is the hand of God has been removed from the people. And and the hand of God is is significant in two ways. One one, uh, one time, uh, uh, one way, the hand of God is a blessing, right? It's, you have the, God's hand upon you and God's favor upon you. And, and another way, an expression is the God's hand upon you and judgment. And what he's expressing here is that God's hand of judgment has been removed from you. That you see, God is in your midst because his wrath has been averted. We've seen it 
Three times, first in the sin of Peor, God's wrath was averted because there was a punishment made by Phineas by driving the spear through those two people. God's wrath was averted with Achan because they sacrificed Achan and his family there. And we see another time here that God's wrath is averted. Well, we know that the wrath of God and the, the, the hand of God has been removed in judgment and wrath against us, and that, that today, the day of salvation has come, and God is really in our midst, because Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. That Jesus stood in the gap for us. That Jesus took the death we deserve. That Jesus died where we should have died and gave His life and now gives us life. And so now the, the breach of faith that we have committed, the sin and our iniquities have been laid on Christ. Today the hand of God has been removed through the wrath that was absorbed by His Son. Verse 32 and Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the priest, the chief priest, returned to the people of Reuben, the people of Gad, and the land of Gilead, to the land of Canaan, to the people of Israel, and brought back word to them. And the report was good. The report was good. Not like the report when Moses sent out their spies. This report was good in the eyes of the people of Israel. And the people of Israel blessed God. They spoke no more making war. Then they may destroy the land of the people of Reuben and Gad were settled. The people of Reuben, the people of Gad, called the altar witness. They praised God. Because when God brings salvation, it should evoke praise inside of our souls. Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His heavenly places. Praise Him for His mighty deeds. Praise Him for His excellent greatness. That everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Blessed or praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus in the heavenly places, even as He chose us before Him in Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless. He in love predestined us to be sons and daughters of Him, according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace. In Him, in Christ, we have been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works out all things according to the counsel of His will. And we too were the first to hope in Christ, Paul says, to the praise of His glorious grace. And you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, were sealed with the Holy Spirit of God, who is a guarantee of the inheritance that we receive when we acquire possession of it. What? To the praise of His glory. It should evoke praise, the salvation of God through His Son, Jesus Christ. And they said, this altar, this altar is a witness. And what is this? What, is, what witness is it? It is that the Lord is God. That's what it is. That's what evangelism is. That the Lord is God. What happens here in Joshua 22? They, they realize that the unity is preserved the unity of God is preserved in this passage. The two and a half tribes, the nine and a half tribes, they are one people worshiping one God. Jesus prays for our unity, brothers and sisters, in John chapter 17. I pray that they may be one. The disciples who have given me and those all who believe on account of my word may be brought together and be one as you and our Father at one. They may be brought into our love to enjoy us and be one as we are one. God has ordained that we as His people be unified. It also shows us that we must have proper worship. That we can't just worship whatever or however we want. This book, this word, the Bible regulates our worship. That our worship is of God, the triune God. That's it. There's one God in three persons. And how we worship, as we read this morning in John 4, 24, that we worship in spirit and truth. Take that to understand that we worship by and in and, 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 and by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And we worship in truth through the Word of God. And as it points to the incarnate truth, Jesus Christ alone. We also understand the purity of the church, that we are to seek the holiness of God. That we are to be about holiness in our personal lives and corporately as a church. We understand that there's proper worship 
And that we must not only worship God individually properly, but we as a people ought to worship God properly as well. Brothers and sisters, we look at Joshua chapter 22. We understand that it evokes a praise inside of our soul. We understand that God has called us to this worship of Him to make sure that the people inside the church and outside the church know that the Lord, Yahweh, is God. That our evangelism, that our gospel proclamation points to Jesus Christ and making much of Him and saying, this is the Lord. I've tasted and I've seen. I, I have come into contact with this God. He's lifted me up out of the miry pit. And He set my feet upon the solid ground. And He has put a new song in my mouth. A song of praise to our God. And many will fear and put their trust in the Lord. We praise Him. We tell you today, I tell you today, this is the Lord God. Come and bow down and worship before Him. Come and, 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 and give your life to Christ and bow before Him and wholly follow Him today. If you're watching with us this morning, you're a believer and you already have a relationship with Christ. I encourage you, as, as Joshua or Eli, or, uh, commissioned the people of Israel, I commission us today to wholly follow Christ. To cling to Him. To bow down, yes, but to abide in Him. To hold on to the feet of Christ. To bow before His feet. And by the Holy Spirit of God, may He indwell you and empower you to do the things He's called you to do. And don't shun obedience. But know because of the therefore that has been promised. You can walk. You can live. You can walk in the Lord. And Phineas walked with the Lord. Enoch and Genesis describes that he walked with God and he was no more. In G Genesis chapter 6, it said Noah walked with God. We see in 1 Kings, he describes David as a man who walked with God. We see in Malachi chapter 2 that Malachi walked with God. We see all over the Bible and Paul tells the Ephesians in chapter 4, walk in a manner worthy. How do we walk in a manner? How do we live out this manner of the gospel? How do we keep pure? How do we provide proper worship? How do we walk like this? Because in chapter 3, in chapter 3, right before chapter 4, verse 1 of Ephesians, where he says, therefore, there's something else preceding that. And he says, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than we could ever ask or think, according to the power, that's the Holy Spirit, at work within us, May be glorified in the church and in Christ Jesus forever, from generation to generation. Amen. God is able to do that in us by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Oh God, forgive us. Forgive us and grant us repentance. Oh God, for any ways that we have broken faith, we have gone against you. We're not communicated to you the way you should be communicated. Father, forgive us. You are holy. Oh God, you are glorious. We need you. And this morning I pray, oh God, that we would see that you are the Lord. Mm -hmm. That our hearts would be mesmerized by who you are. God, if there's anyone that doesn't know you, if that's you today, know that you can turn from your sin. Repent. Just run from it and say, I don't want my sin. I want Jesus. I believe, Jesus, you died and rose again. And that you, I can, with you, I can believe and put my faith in you and you will save me. He will. He'll forgive you. He'll cleanse you completely. You have eternal life in Christ Jesus. You will have a relationship with God. You will know the one and only God in Jesus Christ, His Son. Come to Him today. Believe on Him today. And help us, O oh God, who already have a relationship. Help us in our unbelief. Grant us repentance from it. 
and grant us greater trust to behold you. In Jesus' name, amen. through his word, 
by His Spirit. And that this week, that song would reverberate throughout your soul. That we are to behold our God. And behold Him before a lost and dying world. That they would know, this is the Lord. We are commissioned by God in His Word. In Ephesians chapter 3, as we referred to earlier. Now to Him who is able to do far more abundantly than we could ask or think. According to the power at work within us, to Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Don't